The Life of Lycurgus, adapted from Plutarch's Parallel Lives. Please note that the story you're about to hear is the story that the historian and biographer Plutarch presents. It is a starting place for exploring Sparta, not the definitive truth. Plutarch held beliefs with which many people would disagree, and we should not take his word as law. Nevertheless, he tells a heck of a story, and his work continues to captivate audiences nearly 2,000 years later. Lycurgus Shrouded by time, the truth of Lycurgus's life remains tantalizingly out of the uh, historical record. But his legacy is distinct and clear. Traditions say that Lycurgus carried in his veins the blood of uh, the kings from one of the two Spartan royal families. His most famous ancestor was King Saus, who conquered many lands and enslaved the Helots. The capture of the Helots in their land brought Sparta many riches, but it proved to be an inescapable curse as well. The Spartans were doomed to unending warfare, for the Helots never forgot that they had once been free, and they remained determined to regain their freedom by throwing off the Spartan yoke. And so the Spartans, outnumbered seven to one, lived on the sword's edge, one mistake away from being torn apart by their angry subjects. In those early times, Sparta's neighbors pressed in on all sides, as they were angry at the Spartans. When Lycurgus's father, the king of Sparta, died, the crown went to Lycurgus's older brother, Polydectes. He died soon thereafter, making Lycurgus king. That is, until Polydectes' widow announced that she was pregnant with a child. By Spartan law, the unborn child of the king had the right to the crown above the younger brother. Lycurgus declared the unborn child to be the lawful heir to the throne and announced that he would administer the government only until the birth of the child. In secret, Polydectes' wife came to Lycurgus and offered to kill the child when it was born if Lycurgus would agree to marry her and make her queen once more. And though such a terrible offer horrified Lycurgus, he pretended to agree and told his men to keep a careful watch over Polydectes' widow. He instructed his men to bring the child to him immediately after its birth so that he might protect his nephew. And when the time came and the baby was born, Lycurgus's men act swi acted swiftly, and Lycurgus took the child in his arms. He assembled the people and said, A king is born unto you, O men of Sparta. He gently placed the baby on the throne of his brother and named him Chiaris, which meant people's joy. All in all, Lycurgus was king for only eight months. Furious at being tricked, the former queen found many other people in court who were envious of Lycurgus, Lycurgus and wished to harm him. They spread rumors that he would secretly kill the young King Chiaris and take the throne for himself once more. They spread so many rumors that if any accident befell the young boy, regardless of the details, Lycurgus would surely be blamed. He therefore decided to avoid the suspicion by traveling abroad and to continue his wanderings until his nephew came of age and had a son of his own to succeed him on the throne, thereby guaranteeing that Lycurgus could not be king. Part 2. The Travels of Lycurgus And so Lycurgus set sail and went to the island of Crete. There he studied the many forms of government and made many powerful friends. Some of the ideas he found he liked and he wrote them down to bring back to Sparta. Many more ideas he saw to be flawed and those he refused to take back with him. On Crete, Lycurgus met a wise man, man named Thales, who was extremely clever and witty. Thales pretended to be a poet, for he wrote wonderful poems and songs, but really he was one of the mightiest lawgivers of his age. His poems and songs were more than fun, since each one had a carefully crafted message of wisdom. Those who heard his songs found themselves to be singing the catchy tunes for weeks, and thus voicing the laws and ideas that Thales supported. Such was his power that the listeners unknowingly convinced themselves to give up old hatred hatreds and form compromises on sworn issues. Lycurgus convinced Thales to travel to Sparta and prepare his people to reinvent themselves as citizens in the perfect polis. After his time on Crete, Lycurgus traveled to Asia Minor, where he journeyed from town to town, learning the laws of each polis. Like a doctor, comparing the healthy body to a sick one, Lycurgus compared the practices of a polis against polis, trying to determine what made some cities great, but others weak and corrupt. The Spartans missed Lycurgus and sent messages begging him to come home. Even the kings wanted Lycurgus to return, because they hoped the people would behave better with his guidance. And with his journey finished, Lycurgus agreed and found a joyous Sparta waiting to receive him and hear the wisdom he had found in his travels. Lycurgus told the Spartans that he had found an answer to their troubles, uh, but that the cure was not a simple bandage to slap on top of the illness of, of the polis. 
A true cure required them to change everything down to their cores. Full of determination, Lycurgus left Sparta and traveled to the famous oracle of Delphi to seek the help of Apollo, the god of reason. When he entered the holy shrine, the oracle addressed him as beloved of the gods and rather god than man. She said that Apollo had granted his prayers and promised Lycurgus that his laws would be good and that his constitution would be the best in the world. Thus encouraged, Lycurgus began to work uh, to convince the people of Sparta to adopt his changes. And when the time for action came, he ordered 30 men to go armed into the marketplace and strike terror into those of the op opposing parties. When the noise began, King Caius fled to safety, fearing that the whole affair was a conspiracy to steal his throne. But Lycurgus soon convinced him that he had nothing but love and support for his nephew, and having sworn an oath for Caius' safety, the king left his place of refuge and joined his uncle's cause. Part 3. The Government of Lycurgus Lycurgus created the Council of Elders, which brought balance to the government. The council, made up of the 28 wisest men of Sparta, could work with the people to block the kings from becoming tyrants, but could also team up with the kings to block the people from seizing too much power and bringing the state to uncontrolled chaos. The number of men was set at 28, because it is the next perfect number after 6, and as such was thought to be especially important. Also, Lycurgus made the number 28, because with the two kings added in, there were 30 members in the ruling council. Lycurgus appointed the first Gerousia himself, but afterward decreed that the members should be appointed by election, from the most deserving men over the age of 60. This honor of being selected marked the greatest that any Spartan could receive, as it was a recognition of a lifetime of achievement. Elections in Sparta followed strict rules. All of the Spartan warriors would assemble on a great field while the judges went into a closed room nearby. Each judge carried a tablet with numbers listed. Silently, the candidates would appear before the soldiers who would shout loudly when their preferred candidate appeared. The judges would not know the order of the candidates, but simply listened for which number received the loudest shouts. The candidate who received the loudest support was declared the winner and served on the council for the rest of his life. Lycurgus mixed the power of monarchy with the power of the aristocracy, and then balanced it with the power of democracy, for he gave the citizens the deciding voice and the power to tell their leaders yes or no. When the king and council wanted to make a law, they presented it to the people who could vote it up or down. The people could not introduce their own laws or change an idea being presented to them, but no laws could exist without the agreement of the citizens. When the king's wife complained to her husband that he would we leave a weaker crown for his son because of all of the power he had given up to the reforms, her husband replied, No, it will be greater since it will last longer. Indeed, by giving up some of the power of the kingship, Sparta avoided a bloody civil war and the overthrowing of kings that engulfed most of the city-states of Greece at one point or another. Lycurgus changes the character of Sparta. A second and very bold change of Lycurgus was his redistribution of the land. At that time, the land mostly belonged to a few rich aristocrats, and many citizens found themselves to be without a way to make an honest living. Lycurgus hated what he saw as the lazy luxury of the rich and the lawlessness of the poor and decided to fix all of it. He persuaded the people to combine all of their land into one great property, which Lycurgus divided up evenly so that no man would receive more or less than any other. For the people of Sparta, he created 9,000 plots of land so that each should have barley, wine, and olive oil. For the people from the towns around Sparta, called the Perioikoi, Perioikoi means neighbor, he created 30,000 plots of land for them to farm. And it is said that when he traveled through the countryside and saw the heaps of grain standing parallel and equal to one another, he smiled and said, all of Sparta looks like a family farm, newly divided among many brothers. Even though the land was split evenly, Lycurgus realized that some people would cling to their greedy old ways. He knew that they would not agree to let him simply take their gold and treasure away, so he countered all of Sparta's greed by a clever trick. First, he outlawed all gold and silver coins. From that point on, Lycurgus decreed all the money would be cast out of iron. Uh, iron is heavy and not particularly valuable, so any purchase would require a large chest to hold the near worthless money and a team of oxen would be needed to transport the weight of the metal. Since the money was such a pain to use and not worth very much, nobody wanted to steal it and it would be near impossible to hide even if they did. Additionally, the iron was quenched when red hot in tubs of vinegar, which was said to make them brittle and supposedly useless to blacksmiths. With no valuable coins to gain, no traders wanted to come to Sparta. 
No merchants brought fancy wares. No artists came to sell extravagant art, since nobody wanted Sparta's near-worthless money. Thus, Lycurgus stamped out the desire for fancy goods and luxuries. Men with riches held no advantage over the poor, because their wealth found no use, but instead had to sit uselessly at home. As a final blow to greed, Lycurgus told the Spartans to eat together in the company of their fellow citizens, so that they may all, may all enjoy the same foods and not grow fat or soft by secretly gobbling down rich delicacies on soft couches. The greedy could not eat decadent or rich foods and then come to the common dinner because the other Spartans would see their less than normal appetite and mock them for eating like a weakling. The common meals that the Spartans shared together were not all held in a single dining hall, but in groups of 15 or so called Phaeditia because of the friendships they created. Um, each member donated food once a month so that they all ate barley, cheese, figs, wine, and meat. When any member of this dining group made a sacrifice to the gods, he sent part of the meat to share with his Phaeditia. The rich citizens responded with outrage to the proposed changes of Lycurgus, and together they vowed to stop him. First they yelled and shouted at him, but soon their mood turned violent and they pelted him with stones. One man, named Alicander, put out Lycurgus's eye. But Lycurgus was descended from hard men, and he faced the crowd calmly, showing the people his bloody face and his ruined eye. Overcome with shame, the mob settled, and the stones stopped flying. For Alicander, who had ruined Lycurgus's eye, the people agreed that Lycurgus should be the one to decide a just punishment. He did the boy no harm, but ordered Alcander to stay with him and work off his crime by serving as Lycurgus' attendant and servant. Alcander had a good heart deep down, and he agreed to the punishment with stoic resolve. As the days went by, he saw the strength and the wisdom and the selflessness of Lycurgus, and slowly his anger turned to respect and then to deep admiration. Alcander reported to his friends that Lycurgus was a just and wise man, and over time his words convinced them. Thus, Lycurgus turned a violent enemy into a tireless ally, not with force, but with wisdom and respect. <laughs>